A little bit of a dilemma. I've got two passages of scripture. So what one preacher said, he said, I'm going to preach this one, and if I don't feel like it's the right one, I'm going to go ahead and preach the second one. But I probably won't do that. I'm just hoping the Lord will help us this morning. Turn to Psalm 84. Psalm 84. I'm just going to read the whole psalm this morning. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even feigneth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well, and the rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength, every one of them in Zion, appeareth before God. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Father, we thank you this morning. For this beautiful psalm, we thank you, Lord, for the cry of the psalmist's heart this morning to be in the house of God, to be in the sanctuary, to be in the midst of collective worship again, to be where the word of God is, is preached and taught, to be where the songs of Zion are sung and the saints rejoice and the people of God lift up voices and holy hands to praise thee. Father, we're admonished in our day to do the same. Meet with us this morning, Lord. Help us to praise you. Help us, Lord, to love thy house. Help us to love thy ways. Help us to desire to see thee in the sanctuary. We're thankful this morning, Father, for the wonderful privilege of worship today. Father, we ask that you would help us to break this down and Help us to rightly divide the word of God. Help us to preach this morning. Lord, as only you can anoint and inspire us to speak. And we'll give you thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. It doesn't say that David is the author of this psalm, but most scholars believe that David was behind this psalm somewhere. But whoever it was, and it would fit David at times in his life when David was running from Saul or maybe when he was running from Absalom, his son, when David was exiled from Jerusalem, when he was living in caves and running from Saul and when he had no time or opportunity to be where the temple was, where the, where the tabernacle was at that time, but we're trusting and, and David was looking, David was looking at that opportunity and he said, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. There was a hunger in this man's heart. 
There was a desire, an intense desire to worship God, to be in fellowship with God's people, to have that opportunity. And we may not realize how precious it is until it's gone either. I fear that many people will never ever really recognize what it means to be able to gather here three times a week, have revivals and have camp meetings. They'll never begin to realize the benefit of that until something happens down the road and it's no longer available to us. It's, uh, <clears throat> but David, if it was David, is looking back at the time when he could go to the house of God. There are many Psalms that David wrote. He said, How, you know, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. His desire was there. His communion was there. He was able to fellowship with God in, in the communion of the saints and in the fellowship of the body of Christ. Uh, would be the body of Christ today, the Old Testament church at that time. But he said, my heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. He envied the sparrow. <laughs> the little sparrow had found a place inside the temple to build his nest. He envied the little sparrow. He said, she's found a place inside thy tabernacle and she can raise her young there. David was even thinking the birds had it better than he did. <laughs> when they could get into the place of, of the sanctuary, hear the beautiful songs of Zion, hear the wonderful message of God's love and covenant with His people. Friend, I tell you, it is a real privilege this morning for us to be able to gather together like this, and we ought to be praising the Lord. We ought to be glad that we're able to do this. You know, we think about Brother Henry, we think about different ones. Uh, Brother Childs, before he went home to heaven, he got to the point he couldn't come. You know, we may reach a stage of life where we're not able to get through the doors, we're not able to drive to the parking lot, we're not able to get here. Uh, friend, I tell you, we ought to be taking advantage today of the opportunity and praising and thanking God this morning for the church. God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. I know the building is not uh, the main thing, but the people of God have a place together. And when people gather here that know God, it becomes a holy place. It becomes a place that ought to be highly respected and highly revered. And God's presence ought to be looked for and coveted in this gathering of God's people. Amen? Amen. Friend, we've gone too long without the manifestation of the glory of God. Oh, I can tell you from times gone by in my life, we were anxious to get to church. We were looking forward to getting to the house of God because we didn't know what God was going to do. There was fresh outpourings. There were blessings. There were times of praise. There were times when of weeping. There were times when we were instructed. There were times friend, when we just minded the Lord and the Lord blessed our hearts tremendously. Oh, we need to exercise our full privileges this morning in serving and loving God. Until the excitement, the excitement that was in this man's heart to get back to the house of God. We need Him. These are depressing days. Would you have to admit that? I've almost quit reading the news. <laughs> I've almost had to give it up. I mean one thing after another. That is financially insane, politically insane, morally insane. It's just one thing after another that's happening in our, our wonderful country, friend. Oh, I want to tell you, we better begin to look up. <laughs> We better begin to get our eyes on Jesus and take advantage of these precious opportunities to encourage one another, lift one another up, pray for one another. Oh, I tell you, the church is vital and it's always been vital, but it's going to become even more vital as the pressure mounts. Let me encourage you that we need to get to the place that this writer got to in verse 10. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. 
A thousand days out there, you think of all you can do in a thousand days. All you can buy, all you can sell, all you can gain, all you can enjoy. But David, or whoever this was, said, One day in the house of God is better to me than a thousand out there in the world. I don't know how many people are, are there yet. <laughs> I really believe that we're pretty much settled into the way of things down here. I believe we're pretty well anchored to this old earth. I believe that most people are pretty much satisfied with the way things are going. Now there's a few of us that realize that this, uh, this uh, artificial economy is not going to last. We realize that that can't happen. We realize that you can't get out of debt by going deeper in debt. Now that, you know, that sounds so uh, uh, simple that even a moron could understand that. But uh, our government doesn't understand that and I'm surprised there's not a single Democrat that's voting against some of these insane policies. Don't we have any sane Democrats? Evidently not, huh? But our country, our nation, the world is in a dilemma. And they are choosing to do all the wrong things to try to make it better. And because they're doing those things, they're setting the stage for even more evil to come. But I want you to know, church, we have a sanctuary. And we have a place where we can come together and we can meet together and we can feed our souls on the Word of God. We can exercise our spiritual uh, worship desire and need by coming to God and singing and testifying and praying and praising the God of heaven. We have that privilege this morning. By the help and grace of God, I'm going to take advantage of it. David went on to say, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. You know, and you're going to have to make that decision, and people are going to have to make that decision because you can't dwell in both. You can't enjoy what's happening here if you're enjoying the sin that's happening out there. It's oil and water, friend. It just doesn't mix. Sin and salvation don't mix. Either God's grace is going to take care of the sin business or the sin's going to finish off the grace that you had in your heart. And when we just need to decide which tent, which tabernacle we want to dwell in. Oh, I'm so glad this morning that I settled that question a long time ago. Amen. I decided to go with Jesus and that meant turning my back on the world and the sins of this whole world. And I said, goodbye, oh world, goodbye. Amen. And I'm so glad this morning that I did. I have no regrets. I have no remorse. I look at people with Biden bumper stickers and I think to myself, are you having any regrets yet? If they have any sense, they're surely having some regrets. Oh, but I want to tell you, I have no regrets in not answering the call of the King. Have no regrets this morning answering the call of Jesus Christ. He touched me. And He made me new. And He put new desires in my heart. And He wrote His law on the fleshly tables of my heart. You know, there's a lot of I'm going to use a big word, but I'll tell you what it means. Antinomianism. Isn't that a big word? Lawlessness. Anti-law. If you have your thinking cap on, you could read John Fletcher's five volumes on his checks to antinomianism. But there is a growing church movement in our world today that says the law is gone, the law is no longer valid, the Christian is not under the law, and I know there is a sense in that, but I want to tell you, friend, if I don't have any restrictions, 
then I can steal your things without any condemnation. I can lie to you without any condemnation. If the law is no longer valid or binding on the Christian, there is no such thing as sin. Stop and think. Paul said I was in chapter 7 when he's trying to illustrate an unconverted Jew trying to keep the commandments. He said, I was alive once. But sin came along and I, sin revived and I died. How did he die? Why did he die? Because sin showed him what he really was. Sin portrayed him. Friend, without sin, there is no responsibility. Without the knowledge of sin, there's no responsibility. There's no accountability. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, but even after you're brought to Christ, you still can't steal. That's spelled two different ways. Steal, can't steal. Wonderful English language. Isn't it? You can't lie and be a Christian, right? Can't commit adultery and be a Christian. Can't covet your neighbor's belongings and be a Christian. Can't break the Sabbath and be a Christian. Oh, the Sabbath is not important. Jesus did away with the Sabbath. Friend, the Sabbath was here long before the law was. It is God's second institution that He made in creation. The first was the home and established the home, established marriage between a man and a woman. And the second institution was He established a day of rest, a day of worship, a day set aside for spiritual and not economic and physical and material gain. And it's still there. There's a big argument over whether it's Saturday or Sunday. Our calendar doesn't go back to creation. We don't know which is the sixth day anymore. But I know what the New Testament church started doing even in the book of Acts. They separated themselves from Judaism which had rejected Christ and started meeting together, started holding services, started lifting offerings on the Lord's day. It's good enough for me. Praise God, it's good enough for me. I tell you this morning, I've seen God move on the Lord's day. I've seen some glorious times in the sanctuary on the Lord's day. And if it was grieving God so bad as some people say that it's the mark of the beast, we're antichrist. If we don't worship on Saturday, we're antichrist. It's hard for me to believe the Holy Spirit would bless and rejoice the hearts of the saints and convict the hearts of sinners and even save them on the Lord's day if it was such an abominable thing, wouldn't it? I wonder why it took 18 centuries for the seven-day Adventists to come along and show the church world they were wrong. 18 centuries after Christ is when the seven-day Adventists came along. I would have thought the Lord would have corrected that error long before 1,800 years went by, wouldn't you? Well, I want to tell you something this morning. It's a beautiful thing to be in church. It ought to be our desire. It ought to be something that we look forward to. The Lord's Day ought to be the high day of our week. This ought to be the highest day, the most looked forward to day. Not TGIF. I know working people look forward to Friday evening if they don't have to work Saturday. <laughs> Some don't get a break on Friday night. They have to go hit it again on Saturday. But I want to tell you, friend, it's not Friday and it's not the weekend that we live for. It's the Lord's Day that we live for. It's the Lord's Day that we want to be a part of. It's the church gathering that we want to see happening because we want to be in the house of the Lord. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. People are going to have to choose. We have a lot of false prophets and false teachers and wolves in sheep's clothing this morning filling the pulpits of America and the world. But I want to tell you something, friends. Sin still separates from God. And you cannot indulge. Well, John said, if any man say walk in the light and walk in darkness, he lies. 
does not the truth. He also said in the first, third chapter of 1 John, He that is born of God does not commit sin. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And over and over and over the scriptures teach us that the Christian does not practice sin. There's a possibility you may sin. There's a possibility you may be overtaken in a fault. There's a possibility you might be overtaken in a temptation. And we have an advocate in that situation. Thank God, the second chapter of 1 John said, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Thank God. If we do blunder, we can get on our knees and make it right with God and get back up and keep moving. But he doesn't sit around and practice sin or premeditate sin and go ahead and do it day in and day out. No, sir, that's not the Christian way. That's the tense of wickedness. That's living out there under the old uh, devil's reign. That's where that's at. It said, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Our sisters already testified about the grace. That unmerited, undeserved goodness of God that's given out to you every day. Oh, friend, aren't you glad for grace this morning? Grace, grace, God's grace. Oh, friend, when we look at us who were vile and wretched, John uh, Newton said, a wretched sinner. Oh, friend, but I want to tell you, Jesus looked on us in mercy and grace and said, I can make something out of you. I can change your life. I can change your nature. I can fix you up to where you won't know yourself. Praise God for grace, saving grace, sanctifying grace, keeping grace. There's all sorts of grace. And it's all available to the children of God. And friend, a good place to find grace is in the house of God. A good place to be availing yourself of the grace of God is right here. Where there's people of the like precious faith. People that love you. People that will pray for you. People that will pat you on the back and say, hey, you can make it. You don't get a lot of that out there in the world. The world's no friend of grace. But oh, I'm so glad for the church, aren't you? I'm so glad that in that church, the Lord God is a sun and shield. And He will give grace and glory. Friend, the glory is going to come as a result of grace. The blessings of God, the presence of God, the anointing of God, the, the, the wonderful, miraculous uh, things that God does for us, this glory awaits us. And then the full glory awaits us when we get to heaven. There's going to be a time what a day that will be, the songwriter said, when my Jesus I shall see. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. friend. We find that hope right here. You didn't find that hope at Walmart? The greeter doesn't say praise the Lord when you enter the store, does he? No, he doesn't. He doesn't hand you a New Testament or a songbook and say, here, praise the Lord in Walmart. Nope. Now you might sing a song in Walmart and get by with it. You might testify in Walmart and get by with it. Go ahead and try it. Let me know how it works. But you can get by with it here. That's the thing that baffles me sometimes, how we do so little of it when we're right here where it's supposed to be done. In the atmosphere and the presence of Almighty God, we're here to praise Him and worship Him and sing unto Him and give Him honor and glory and raise up holy hands without wrath or doubting, praising the Lord. If you're not careful, Arthur will get you where you can't do that. So go ahead and get rid of Arthur. Amen. Praise. Get him up. You know, we're, we're missing out on some things, I fear. I fear we're just missing out on some opportunities. There's grace and there's glory. No good thing will He withhold from them 
that walk uprightly. Is that a promise or what? Sounds like a promise to me. No good thing will he withhold from them that walketh uprightly. I want you to know this morning, God wants us to praise him. God wants us to rejoice. In fact, this, was it Paul in one of his letters said, Rejoice, with, pray without ceasing, rejoice always. You know, we, we, we need to get back to the idea that we can praise Him. We can thank Him. We can worship Him in praise and in song and in rejoicing. Lord, thank You. Thank You, Jesus. You know, we've got so much that I fear that we're not as thankful for it as we ought to be. We have so much, don't we? We have such an abundance of everything right now. But if the present administration has its way, you won't even be able to buy a hamburger in another 20, 30 years. They're going to do away with our beef cattle. Bill Gates is buying up all the farming land. What in the world is going on out there? What in the world is going on in our country? There's a state that passed a law against, against breeding cattle and called it sexual molestation of cattle, making it against the law to artificially inseminate, which is the way most big herd producers do their breeding. It's been practiced for years and years, and now there's states within the United States that's calling that a crime. A crime. See why I've quit reading the news? It's insane. I guess they want you to live on... Uh, dandelion sprouts and I don't know what all you can pick off the berries and season around here but I want to tell you there's an all out war against meat but God said I'll not withhold any good thing if you'll walk uprightly if you'll do what's right if you'll do what I say I'll not withhold any good thing from you. I'm glad for that this morning. I'm glad for what God wants to do. The Lord of hosts. Let me just go back. I skipped that one letter word. Oh, Lord of hosts. Blessed is the man, generic, woman, that trusteth in thee. There's the E-T-H. Not trusted 40 years ago and quit trusting 20 years back. Trusteth is he that trusted back there 40 or 60 years ago and still trusting today. It's still working today. Faith is still active today. Still believing God. Still trusting God this morning. Blessed is that person. Blessed is that man or woman that's trusting God. Believing in God. Is our help going to come from Washington? I don't think so. The scientific world, I tell you what, they're so confused. <laughs> I wish I'd have brought the numbers with me. How many people that have been vaccinated fully that's had the COVID? I'm not telling you what to do. You take the shots if you want to take the shots and feel like you should take the shots. Take the shots. But friend, I'm not sure we can trust the current scientific world, quote unquote. I'm not sure we can. But I am sure who you can trust. I am sure who you can rely on. I am sure who you can put your confidence in this morning and he'll never ever fail you. His name is Jesus. Amen. Blessed is the person that trusteth in the Lord. He wants to be the doorkeeper here rather than to run Walmart or Macy's or Saks on Fifth Avenue. He wants to be the doorkeeper in the house of the Lord greater than he wants any other pleasure in this world. Any other treasure in this world. Any other position in this world. David said, let me be tied to the doorpost. 
Let me be the doorkeeper. Let me be an art terminal. Let me be the greeter. Let me be the greeter at the door of the sin sanctuary. Just let me get inside. Let me be a part. Let me be in the sanctuary. Oh God, help us this morning to have such a fervent desire for God and for His glory and for His grace and for those things that are manifested in the church building that we would be here. Now there are circumstances which we all understand that would hinder us from time to time. But the Hebrew writer warned us that in the last days we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so much more, to emphasize it, he said so much more should we not forsake it as we see the day approaching. Do you see any day approaching? Do you see the coming of the Lord? Do you see the Antichrist system taking shape? Do you see things that are happening to, that's going to wrap up this dispensation and the time of the Gentiles is going to be fulfilled? Friend, we're living right there in that moment. We're living in the collapse of the United States of America, but we're living in the very moment when things are going to change dispensationally. And the Antichrist is going to set up his kingdom. One man said there's only one thing that's needed. This was one of the men who, who helped turn Germany. He said, how in the world, how in the world did you get all of Germany to go along with Hitler? He said, the only thing you need to get people to comply is you need to scare them. Scare them. Put fear in them. They will march in line if you get them scared. What do you see happening in America today? We're marching to the beat. Getting us ready, setting the stage, getting us tuned to doing what they tell us to do instead of maybe seeking God and asking His direction. Getting clear leadership from the Lord. Friend, I tell you, church is vital. To be able to hear the truth and be able to be taught the truth, to be able to sing about the wonderful uh, principles and themes of Christianity. Amen. To be able to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Amen. Till our faith is renewed, our fire and the glory has come to renew our zeal and our love for God. Amen. How important is church this morning to you? Church is vitally, critically important. And this psalmist realized that. And he made no bones about it. He says, O oh Lord, give ear unto my prayer, O oh God of Jacob, who is behold our shield and look upon the face of thine anointed, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. Praise his name this morning. You know, the world's having fun, or at least they think they are. But I want you to know this morning, that he gives joy and he gives peace and he brings contentment and he gives satisfaction and he has the only means of salvation that you can find anywhere. You can't find salvation anywhere else than outside of the Christian message and gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm so glad I found him, aren't you? I'm so glad I found him. And I trust that you're rejoicing this morning. That you've committed yourself to be a part of a body of Christ that's going to work together, pray together, pull together, worship together, experience God together, and covet his presence, covet his glory as we meet in the sanctuary. Shall we stand?